Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Steve Crawford. I'm the Senior Associate Dean at the OU College of Medicine. I'm also Director of the Oklahoma Primary Healthcare Improvement Cooperative. You're here today to uh, hopefully to come to a, a conference we're calling uh, Taking the Pain Out of Chronic Pain Coding. As many know, chronic pain is a a common problem, particularly among our older adults receiving care in primary care practices, where many clinicians may not have the training, time, and counseling or resources to manage this problem. We're here to try to help you learn how to optimize not only chronic pain management approaches, but to do it through proper coding techniques. Uh, and we're uh, uh, pleased to have today Mr. Zachary Grimes, who has a, a, um, a specialty in coding, particularly in this area. He works for the Oklahoma um, uh, Foundation for Medical Quality, who's a partner with us in helping primary care practices in many aspects of their care. Um, Chuck, if you will go to my first two slides. So I wanted uh, first to just uh, kind of be uh, silly. We know that several years ago, we went under a new coding system called ICD-10. And I just, to start the process off, I just thought it fun to just look at some of the more peculiar coding uh, codes that are available uh, for us to use, uh, just to make, um, light of some of the things, and I, it, some of them are just quite remarkable. Um, but one of these codes that I've listed is actually not real. And, and I'd be, uh, so you can go down a spacecraft collision injuring the occupant, the sequelae of that, the struck by a macaque initial encounter is quite funny. Um, being in a swimming pool of a prison is the place of an occurrence of a cause, bitten by a pig, struck by a duck, uh, and struck by a drone are all quite unusual. Does anyone know which one isn't though real, which I actually took some believe that it should be, but it, at this moment, there is not a specific code for this event. <laughs> there you go. It's struck by a drone, subsequent encounter. So with that, I just thought it would be <laughs> if, uh, if others who are getting on could please mute. <laughs> this wasn't uh, a test to, to make sure you knew those things, but obviously drones are becoming more important in, in everyday life. And that is a code that some people have been advocating that we should have. That particular one, I think, Chuck, if you will click again, is actually the code for this, which I think is even more unusual. Do it one more time. It's sucked into a jet engine, which you would think is a very unusual um, event, but not according to the people who designed our ICD coding system. But anyway, with that, uh, again, I want to take this opportunity uh, to uh, welcome Zach Grimes, who should be uh, um, here available for us to teach us all about taking the pain out of chronic pain coding. Zach, I'll uh, turn off my monitor and let you um, get on with the conference, but I'll be available if there's any questions. Uh, so please, you can use the uh, 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 chat to uh, offer up any questions, but we'll also, at the last 10 minutes, uh, open it up for verbal uh, questions. So, Zach, thank you very much. Of course, and thank you for the warm introduction, Dr. Crawford. Very much appreciated. All right, so today we have Taking the Pain Out of Chronic Pain. I was a coder for four years. I have proficiency in ICD-10-CM, CPT, and PCS coding, all the fun stuff. And I was fortunate enough to gain some compliancy expertise from Integris Health. So next slide. 
Uh, today, we're going to explain the importance of proper coding. And when it comes to chronic pain, we're going to explain chronic pain ICD-10 codes. We're going to learn how to implement the best coding practice guidelines for chronic pain. And we're going to do accurate coding to avoid denials. And that takes us to our main subject, which is chronic pain coding. So the first concept we're going to tackle is the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. This is definitely a very basic concept for most everybody on right now, but still important. So I figured it couldn't hurt to briefly run through it. Acute pain is defined by rapid onset, severe symptoms, and a relatively short course. Chronic pain differs from this and that the pain is typically defined as pain that lasts at least 12 weeks. This kind of pain can feel sharp or dull, create a burning sensation or an aching sensation. It can be steady or it can come intermittently with some people noting that their chronic pain comes and goes without any reasoning. The gist of it is chronic pain can take place in a wide array of differing areas and enlist with many different symptoms. So chronic pain functions by continually sending pain signals to your brain. It can last anywhere from weeks to years to a lifetime. A really interesting article from Science Daily states that the researchers found that the brain itself actually functions differently in patients with chronic pain. When the patient experiences chronic pain, the frontal cortex, which is the area of the brain associated with emotions, fails to deactivate when it should. This essentially leaves the brain stuck in full throttle, which wears out neurons and can even alter their connections. Chronic pain has a lot of physical effects as well. It can limit mobility, flexibility, strength, and can even reduce endurance. So on the next slide, we're gonna deal with the typical causes of chronic pain. Because a big question when it comes to chronic pain is what causes it? And there's actually a litany of reasons as to why it can develop, but one of the major factors for its development is an injury. Chronic pain has been known to develop after injuries due to nerve damage. This can lead to situations where solely treating the underlying injury will not always resolve that chronic pain. So in our next slide, we have other reasons for it because other times chronic pain will show itself without an injury ever having taken place. There are a multitude of different reasons that this can happen and not all of them are fully understood. However, it is very well understood that chronic pain can develop from underlying conditions. And these conditions can include endometriosis, which is a painful disorder that takes place when the uterine lining grows outside of the uterus, inflammatory bowel disease, which is a group of condition that causes painful and chronic inflammation in the digestive tract. We have chronic fatigue syndrome, which is an extreme and prolonged weariness that is accompanied by pain. This list could go on forever. However, the broad overview is that there are a litany of reasons for chronic pain to be able to develop. So over 30% of older adults in the US report chronic pain. Over two thirds of patients with chronic pain report it prevents them from engaging in activities that they enjoy. These facets lead us in a situation where opioids are more commonly prescribed for older adults than any other age group. And an increased use of opioids in older adults has been known to cause overdoses, opioid misuse, sleep impairment, depression, anxiety, and even far-ranging effects like social isolation. With this and the fact that a 2019 study revealed that one in four adults aged 65 and over have received an opioid prescription, it means that there's a lot of requirements that come alongside an opioid prescription. And one of those requirements includes the documenting and coding of chronic pain. So I know that this code G89.2 had previously been used with regularity, but as of 2022, it is no longer considered a valid code. It's not considered specific and it is no longer valid for any submission. This is primarily because a new category of chronic pain codes has been created, which actually subdivides G89.2 into fourth and fifth characters. We'll jump into this in the next slides. So this code is very self-explanatory. Essentially, if the chronic pain being treated is related to an injury, G89.21 is what we're going to bill for, which is one of those reasons for chronic pain that we discussed earlier. 
So our next code is relatively rare for most physicians, but that won't make it non-existent because this kind of pain is common enough to warrant its own admission into ICD-10 CM's code base, which means it has a relative commonality amongst patients. G89.22 covers chronic post-thoracotomy pain, or as many physicians call it, post-thoracotomy syndrome. A thoracotomy is a surgical procedure where a cut is made between the ribs in order to reach the lungs or any other organ located up in the thorax. After the procedure, some pain when taking a deep breath is considered fairly normal. However, there are instances where this pain extends for a longer amount of time than anticipated. These situations are referred to as post-thoracotomy syndrome. And then up next, we'll have our code that covers other chronic post-procedural pain. Since post-thoracotomy pain is really one of the only specific chronic post-operative pain codes available, this will be utilized for virtually every other form of chronic pain resulting from a procedure. This code can cover post macdestomy syndrome, chronic pain following radiotherapy, and many more. Then we have what I've personally noted to be the most commonly utilized chronic pain code, and that is G89.29, other chronic pain. So typically when using this code, it's important for our providers to know that the location of the pain should be coded in the slot above G89.29 if it meets the definition of principal diagnosis. For example, if we have a patient that has right arm pain, then we would utilize M79.601, pain in the right arm. Under that, we're going to put G89.29, other chronic pain. This is a pretty universally utilized chronic pain code, and it is much more preferred than our previously utilized G89.2 code. So up next, we have G89.3, neoplasm-related pain. This is actually a relatively new code that was created in October 2021, and it will fully cover any chronic pain due to a neoplasm. It is gonna be applicable to both primary and secondary neoplasms. Next, we have G89.4, chronic pain syndrome. It is one of the last pain codes we're gonna cover, and it's a condition that actually affects about 25% of people that have chronic pain. It involves symptoms that go far beyond chronic pain, like depression, anxiety, and it can directly interfere with their daily lives. And finally, we have G89.0, central pain syndrome. This is chronic pain that stems from damage to the central nervous system. It can be caused by a stroke, multiple sclerosis, tumors, and a bunch of other conditions. The pain is typically constant and can be debilitatingly severe. When at its worst, it will affect a large part of the body. And other times it can be confined to smaller areas like hands or even feet. So we briefly discussed sequencing earlier, and I think now is going to be an excellent opportunity to really dive deep into that topic. This slide is going to deal with the sequencing of our codes. It's important to remember that all ICD-10 CM codes are sequenced based on the encounter notes and the reason for the patient's admission and encounter. When the chronic pain meets the definition of primary diagnosis, the chronic pain code should be sequenced first. This means that the reason for the visit is specifically for pain management and our chronic pain code is gonna be that first listed code. Can you click that slide for me, Chuck? So an example of this would be a patient with lung cancer whose malignant neoplasm has spread to the brain and bone, getting admitted for treatment of his bone pain caused by that metastasis. In this situation, there is no treatment directed at the cancer itself. So that means our coder may sequence G89.3 neoplasm related pain as the principal diagnosis, followed by that neoplasm code. It should be noted that chronic pain codes should not be reported as the first listed diagnosis if the underlying diagnosis is known and the reason for the patient's service, which would mean that the patient was receiving chemotherapy in that last example. So likewise, if the encounter is for pain control or pain management, we're going to have to assign a code from category G89, followed by the code identifying the specific site of pain. 
Can you give that slide a click real quick, Chuck? Thank you. Another example is a patient being admitted for chronic neck pain due to a previous car accident. The coding logic would inherently follow the same principles listed. This would mean that chronic pain due to trauma, G89.21, will be assigned first, followed by M54.2 cervicalgia to identify the site of that pain. And if the patient presents to the emergency department for unspecified abdominal pain, then it would not be appropriate to assign a code from G89 because our physician did not specify the acuity of pain. Here, we're only going to be assigning the site of the pain. So our next section primarily deals with the documentation and its relationship to coding. There will more than likely be a few disparities between how a diagnosed issue is dealt with from a clinical perspective versus the administrative coding perspective. And this is mainly because of the guidelines coders are forced to work off of. If the guidelines are not adhered to, an account can and usually is denied by an insurer, which leads to a litany of problems that an organization just does not want to deal with. These are CMS guidelines for medical coders in relation to chronic pain. So can you go back one slide for me, Chuck? Perfect. Thank you. Our first relevant guideline deals with the labeling of pain. If the pain is not specified as chronic, then the pain cannot be coded as in a G89 category. This means that if the physician does not label the pain as chronic, it is more than likely going to assume to be of an acute nature. Just like we discussed in our last slide, the exact acuity of that pain has to be documented. So super important to get our docs to document that pain as chronic or the codes being used will not hold up in an audit. So up next, we have a slide that is applicable to every diagnosis. So I felt it had obvious reference to chronic pain coding. If chronic pain is labeled as likely, possible, suspected, consistent with, or any other term indicating that the diagnosis is not 100% certain, then the diagnosis cannot be coded on an outpatient account. This will not hold up on inpatient because there are different stipulations, but it does hold up on an outpatient account. So definitely important to remember that. So up next, we have one that is relatively obvious, but still relevant. Chronic pain syndrome, G89.4, is different than the term chronic pain. Therefore, the code for chronic pain syndrome should only be used when the provider has specifically documented this condition. So from a coding perspective, there's not going to be a time frame for defining when pain becomes chronic pain. What the coders put into the record is entirely reliant on the physician's documentation. However, I would like to say that physicians are going to have a different set of requirements when it comes to their reporting of chronic pain. And we're going to go over this further into the slides. Uh, this next one right here is actually a relatively new rule, and it will definitely have relevance to chronic pain. So when we're detailing the location of pain, any code locating the site is unspecified should rarely be used. These codes should really only be used when the documentation in the record is insufficient to determine the affected side and it's not possible to obtain clarification. And this is because a lot of insurers are actually straying away from codes that have unspecified sides labeled. Always important to remember the location of the pain so our codes can get covered. So our next segment deals with the concept of registries and medical coding and how these two are intertwined. A clinical data registry is an interactive database that collects, organizes, and displays healthcare information. Clinical data registries, also known as patient registries or disease registries, are used to evaluate and improve outcomes for a population defined by a particular condition, disease, or exposure. Specifically, registries use observational study methods to collect and harmonize data about the treatment outcomes and well being of patients who receive care over time. They aggregate large data sets and analyze trends or patterns in treatment and outcomes. 
Registries serve a litany of different purposes and provide immense value. Physicians use registries to evaluate treatment options, procedural options, therapies, and many more issues. This is because registries allow for an understanding of how patients with different characteristics respond to different treatments. Registries are even used by medical device manufacturers and pharmaceutical developers to understand and track safety, effectiveness, and value of their device or substance in the market. Modern clinical data registries are able to go far beyond simple data collection and data warehousing. It transforms data into extraordinarily meaningful insights by applying advanced analytics and data science which really forwards any and all meaningful insights that can be used to achieve a desired outcome. And this is where medical coding and registries come together. Because in order for the purpose of a registry to be fully functional, accurate medical codes must be utilized. Because one of the main sources of information for registries are ICD-10 codes. And the only way to assure that a registry's data set is accurate is to assign the most accurate code set. This inherently means that the more accurate the code listed, then the more accurate the data in our registry is going to be. A lot of this is due to the fact that ICD-10 codes can be set a lot more accuracy than its predecessor code set, ICD-9. For an effective pain registry, specificity of our ICD-10 CM codes is everything. So up next, we have a quick example piece on EHR registry guidance. It's important to note that most EHRs are going to be configured with registry functionality. Our big task with the registry is to configure a chosen set of parameters for the registry. So obviously our session today is going to involve setting up a chronic pain registry. And the first step is already listed here and it's gonna to be to search your EHR for the section or report titled registry. This example right here is from eClinical Works. And as you may know, this format will differ from EHR to EHR. And right here, the second step we're already on will locate the section in the registry needed to set up a new report. Since we want to run a registry on chronic pain, we will select the ICD option. This will allow you to set up the registry with codes from structured data fields within the EHR, such as data entered into the problem list or billing data. And you can also notice here in the registry, you do have several options to set up other queries as well as other structured field data. So up next, we're going to add the appropriate chronic pain code. Can you go forward two slides for me, Chuck? So two, we're gonna be on step three now, perfect. So next we're gonna add the appropriate chronic pain codes to our registry report. This will include the codes discussed in our presentation earlier. You'll also have the option to add multiple codes to your your query and you can work with your EHR vendor if you are needing to set up a report with many codes or a range of codes for other registries. Next, we're going to enter in that desired date range for our chronic pain patient report. Many sites set up reports to monitor their registry on a quarterly basis. After the date range is entered, we will select the option to run new. And lastly, the results will populate into your chronic pain patient registry report. For HIPAA and PHI purposes, I have de-identified this registry report example for the presentation today, and the patient names are examples. From the chronic pain registry report, you will actually be able to run a subset of data from different structural fields, such as diagnostic codes, CPT codes, chief complaints, immunizations, radiology procedures, and even referrals. You could also run letters, send messages to the patient portal, request appointments, and set up flow sheets from your chronic pain patient registry. So earlier we discussed the coding guidelines and how that relates to a timeline for chronic pain. That stipulation is only listed for coders and not physicians. And this is because physicians have their own guidelines to follow like we discussed earlier. And according to compliance and best practices, which aim to regulate the use of opioids in Oklahoma, 
These are the chronic pain restrictions for physicians. If a patient's chronic pain is being treated for three months or more, a practitioner needs to review the course of treatment every three months. Any new information regarding etiology of the pain and progression of the disease needs to be updated so that the treatment can be altered in a sustainable and effective way. The patient needs to be assessed before every renewal to determine if the patient is experiencing a dependency. These situations need to be documented in the assessment. Three, there needs to be evidence of reasonable effort to stop or decrease the dosage or try other treatment modalities, unless there are obvious clinical contraindications that would prevent this. Number four, we're gonna review the PMP. Uh, this is also known as the prescription monitoring program. And five, we're gonna monitor compliance with the patient provider agreement, which requires stating the term chronic pain on the face of the prescription. After one year of compliance with the patient provider agreement, physicians may review the treatment plan and assess the patient on six month intervals. It's also going to be very important to note the following facets of information from Senate Bill 848. Any and all prescriptions for acute pain has to include the words acute pain notated on the face of the prescription by the practitioner. And likewise, as we had just discussed, any prescription for chronic pain needs to include the words chronic pain notated on the face of the prescription by the practitioner. Exceptions to this clause would be patients who are in active treatment for cancer, patients receiving hospice care from an organization providing licensed hospice or licensed palliative care, a patient who is a resident of a long-term care facility, any medications being prescribed for use in treatment of substance abuse or opioid dependency would also meet those exceptional criteria. So with these and many more government-based stipulations, it presents a lot of people that may be asking themselves if there are feasible alternatives present in these situations. And luckily there are. For clinicians, the general rule of thumb will be that when pain lasts beyond 90 days of expected healing, the orientation of that care is going to shift from acute to chronic pain management. And when the focus alternates into chronic pain management, things like closely assessing functional goals, optimizing additional drugs and potential non-drug non treatment options, and ensuring safety if opioids are deemed necessary to prescribe, are going to come on the radar. These are going to be the best way to present factors involved in that diagnosis. And the best way to effectively refocus this care is to start by establishing the goals for pain management. These goals can be discovered by asking the patient, what are the overarching goals for care for the patient based on his or her values and priorities? And how do these goals guide decisions about medical interventions? These questions can be extraordinarily effective in guiding the focus of chronic pain management. And by furthering that talk with the patient's priorities through an interview, you can really distinguish the focus on chronic pain. And this can be furthered by a walk through the patient's day. What do they do in a typical day? Explore changes in daily activities due to pain and how that relates to goals. This can be found by asking a question like, what things are you unable to do as a result of that pain? Assess their baseline functional capacity to monitor any changes. What else were they doing before the pain got bad? Focus on the loss of function to help inform the appropriate in interventional methods. What would they like to be able to do that they just can't right now? And finally, look at the whole person concept to help identify strategies for intervention. What are the activities that give purpose or joy to their life? A total person approach is really assistive in this matter because it helps address multiple factors affecting the patient. So when all of these logistical concerns are addressed, next comes the establishment and integration of a care plan that can encompass the patient's values and treatment options. This will inevitably result in the development of a strategy that focuses on function. If possible, those initial strategies could focus on maximizing non-opioid treatment options. 
to which there are a litany of options listed right here on the right side of the screen. And there are gonna be times when opioid treatment will be deemed necessary. In these moments, it's always a good idea to take stock of the situation by assessing the functional goals, evaluating any ongoing side effects, checking out the Oklahoma Prescription Monitoring Program, screening for opioid misuse or abuse, which can be done through ESPERT, and recommending naloxone as needed. This process will require the creation of an opioid treatment agreement and, depending on the circumstances, a potential referment for addictive treatment with MAT. Now, we have covered a lot of areas with this presentation from coder to clinician, and that is a wide array of spots. That is all I have for you, but does anyone have any big questions surrounding anything we discussed right there? Zach, again, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, very clear, but just to reemphasize, when you have a, a person with chronic pain that has a specific reason for it. Um, and you've, we're, we'll talk about outpatient visit at this point, not inpatient. Mm -hmm. And um, you're seeing them for follow up regarding their chronic pain, but you also are discussing their underlying cause. And a very common cause is, say, low back pain. Mm -hmm. um, if you have somebody with chronic low back pain and you're seeing them because they're also on chronic opioid therapy and they have obviously a chronic pain diagnosis, which way do you, it, di, what sequence of diagnoses do you put for that particular visit? Um, so that can differ based on which insurer is looking at it and which facility, but based off that, I would say you're safe to list the location of that pain and then it's chronicity right below that. And, and do you list chronic pain syndrome as the chronic pain or do you use one of the other chronic pain diagnoses? So if chronic pain syndrome is present, that is going to be the only G89 category code you're going to need right there. Chronic pain syndrome is considered a lot more debilitating, at least to ICD-10 codes, than an average chronic pain would be. And if that is present and what's being treated, that will typically be the principal diagnosis. And is there anything, I, I think I remember there are some other chronic pain like you say, to trauma or chronic pain due to cancer, but is there anything special about chronic pain syndrome we should know that we need to document to make sure that that fits a coder's um, and the insurance company's definition of a syndrome? Um, from the clinical side, I'm sure there is, but from a coder's perspective, it is entirely reliant on what the physician documents. So if a patient has chronic pain syndrome, the simple listing of chronic pain syndrome will be sufficient for a coder to pick that up. Okay, that's good. Now, I do have some questions in the chat. And again, remind everyone if they have a question to put it in the chat. Um, the first one that I have at following a patient visit, does an M code need to have the G89 code listed in that visit as well? Yes, definitely. So when it comes to chronic pain, a simple Listing of chronic pain won't typically cover it unless the area of that pain is also listed. Very good. Uh, another question is, does chronic pain, if you list chronic pain as the diagnosis versus acute pain, does that affect reimbursement or payment for that visit? Um, it could depend on the situation, which one is principal, but it is possible for acute pain and chronic pain to coincide. Okay. And, and so, but it, you think that, say you just seen a patient for chronic pain, mm -hmm. um, that is that by itself a reimbursable event by most insurances? Uh, yes. Depending on the treatment method, as long as there's evidence that the disease is there, which should just be a listing of the area of that chronic pain and then the chronic pain alongside it, as the coder would put, and then what kind of treatment or referrals were made with it. That would be definitely sufficient in an account. Okay. Um, 
And um, another question is, is commonly in primary care, constantly seeing patients with other conditions or issues. A lot to cover with a patient with chronic pain if you're gonna reassess at every visit. Uh, is it preferred to make separate appointments to focus just on the chronic pain in addition to the appointments for such, you know, many uh, older patients have multiple other medical conditions like hypertension, diabetes, and such. So is it better to see them, um, you know, for um, those visits by themselves and then have them come back for a chronic pain visit? Or can you combine all of those into one and bill a bigger, you know, charge for a longer visit? Yeah, that should all easily be combined by a coder. That can definitely all be one visit. Now, what I, re I recall that there is there a limit to the number of codes uh, that you can submit on the form, as it were? It used to be a paper form. Now it's electronic. But do the, um, do the billers uh, have just a limited number of codes they can put down? Yes, sir. That's going to be 24 codes is the max. Really? 24? Yes, it used to be something like three or four, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Actually, there was a problem with COVID because the government hadn't updated their slots yet, which means COVID had to be listed as the top three as soon as that disease started. But it's been expanded to 24. So uh, you can list up to 24 codes for a one clinical visit. Is that yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. But, uh, did not know that. Obviously, you have to document all that in the visit, I assume, that, yes. that you dealt with all 24 issues. Have you ever seen somebody do a 24 code visit? Yes, sir. I coded inpatient for a while. You'd see people in there a month, two months. Okay. Those that makes covered. sense on an inpatient basis, yeah. but, but on an outpatient basis, what's the most codes you've seen? Um, I did observations for a while, which are considered outpatient. So I have seen that get up to 24 on that end as well. Really? Yes, That's sir. amazing. That's yeah. quite amazing. I wasn't aware. Um, what, what are the most common errors that you see from your perspective regarding chronic pain? So the use of that G89.2 code, that will immediately get denied because it no longer exists according to ICD-10. You definitely wanna avoid that. And then the area of the pain, that is a definite big one to watch out for right there. Particularly the side, right, left, arm, yes, sir. Leg, that type of thing. Yes, uh, those unspecified codes that came in maybe about a year ago, a little under a year. I think inpatient accounts, they'll just close down if they don't know the area of it. It's just not reimbursable for a lot of conditions. So that's been a big one coming through too lately. Great, well, that's good. Um, let's see um, if there's any other, um, <laughs> somebody mentioned about the observation nurse having a tough time with the, somebody <laughs> with 24 different problems. <laughs> yes, that's a rough one. Power to would have been a, a rough go of it. So, yes, sir. Um, do you see any changes uh, occurring in the near future regarding chronic pain? Coding? That's always or a any? possibility. Uh, they change things every six months now. So, I mean, these codes, they change with the wind. Right now, this is what is applicable at the moment, but who knows what could happen in the future? It's really up to the people that write the codes and make the guidelines. Um, any, have you seen, um, one of the things we deal with in Oklahoma fairly commonly, uh, unfortunately at this time is the use the, of, uh, medical, and I'll put that in quotes, medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. Um, and somebody that is on medical marijuana and is being treated, do you need to list that as one of the diagnoses that the patient is, um, using that, is that a code that's available to modify anything? Does that help anything? Uh, uh, it's a very tricky gray area, especially since it's not federally legal. So yeah. there's some areas where that use would just be a drug code. But since according to state laws here, you can't do drug use or abuse, which would be the typical labeling. So, I mean, if there was something like cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which yes. involves a lot of vomiting and nausea, you could list that. And there are certain coding guidelines for that. But right now, that's a very gray area. And typically, what we did at Integris when I worked there 
is we would just list it as Z79.899, which is other long-term drug use, since it is, according to state law, listed as medication. So repeat that code again. It's going to be Z79899, which is just other long-term drug use. Ah, but you think it's still important maybe to list that as a, a diagnostic code that a patient is using that in there and you've evaluated that uh, at the time of the visit. So Z codes typically aren't billable. I've seen it on the outpatient side. Some of those medication codes can be picked up, but they're typically considered status code. It just adds wow. more detail on a patient's condition. And if it seems relevant to that encounter, absolutely list it. But if it's not relevant to a condition, you're safe not to pick it up. Okay, okay. Um, I have another question about the use of chronic pain codes specifically for rural health clinics. Are there anything specific that they need to know, uh, such as, you know, the rural health or critical access hospitals and those types of things? No, sir. Those guidelines will be the same for any clinic. Great. Okay. All right. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. Um, I don't see any other questions at this point, but I'm going to open it up to, um, uh, you know, that if people want to ask verbally, uh, they can certainly unmute. But as we go through this, I do want to make note for everyone that's on that our organization, uh, OFIC, the Oklahoma Primary Health Care Improvement Cooperative, does provide very specific free programs available to primary care practices throughout Oklahoma, including how to implement SBIRT, which is again, screening, brief intervention and referral for treatment for depression and substance use disorders, including suicide. We also have one specific for adolescents. We also have a uh, do no harm uh, pain and opioid management. Um, uh, this uh, implementation and following these guidelines, one of which would be obviously using these codes appropriately. We also have an online continuing education program that's available and, and you can get additional information because all of these programs are supported through our collaboration with the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Disorders. Again, we are recruiting uh, new practices for all of these projects. Uh, we have on this particular slide, our SBIRT program that is using a tablet-based screening tool uh, that helps you do it efficiently within your practice that the patient fills out. And then, uh, but more importantly, many know that you should be doing these things, but this is to help you and your clinic and your clinical staff how to implement that into the practice. We support that by having a clinician um, provide an academic detail on the evidence of why this is important. But then we follow it up again with a practice facilitator that comes to your practice and assists you in implementing these guidelines. These are very important in helping you uh, flag patients that are at risk of suicide or severe depression or substance use disorders. And this includes a, a program of, of suicide prevention. We all, you're also able through this program to get free Cognito online training for doing brief interventions, very effective method to learn how to do that motivational interviewing. And again, emphasizing we are recruiting new practices for that project are A-OK -okay if you have a large number of adolescent patients within your practice. This was designed by one of our consultant pediatricians. Again, they do the screening on a tablet or mobile phone. Kids always have mobile phones now. And it, there's, there's specific tools that are made for adolescents that are a little bit different than the adults in the, in the regular SBIRT program. And we also are, again, recruiting um, new practices. If you have a pediatric only or a primary care with a large pediatric or particularly adolescent panel. And then our Do No Harm program is, again, as I mentioned, is a program that helps uh, clinicians and designing programs within their own practice to uh, 
work on treatment plans for both acute and chronic pain, as you noted from Zach's presentation. It's important how you distinguish those and document those in your chart charting. Uh, this is, uh, we made our program to be consistent with both state and federal guidelines and laws. Uh, these are uh, based upon evidence-based best practices, again, supported by academic detailing and practice facilitation. Again, emphasizing there's no cost to practices. And we currently have over 40 uh, uh, practices that are already participating in this particular program. And I think the last is the online training, the link to that, and you can see, and this does provide credit for MDs and DOs, giving them credit, PAs, APRNs, even PharmDs or pharmacists and other health professionals can get a certificate of participation. Uh, there's no cost to getting the credit through this site currently. The Dean of the Medical School has made it available to everyone. And do note that just taking even the module one of this pro program provi that provides an overview of the over Oklahoma requirements of Senate Bill 1446 and meets the one hour training requirement for physicians. Again, if people are uh, interested in any of those programs, they can certainly email me at uh, that email address. Uh, again, I wanna thank our um, uh, colleagues with the Oklahoma uh, Foundation for Medical Quality, particularly uh, Zach Grimes, who did a wonderful job of presenting the, the sometimes very confusing uh, uh, aspect of how we are supposed to code appropriately and to help us better care for our patients of all types, including those who have chronic pain. Any other questions? I do have a note that a copy of this presentation will be sent to those who've registered for the event and will provide a link to the session that will be posted on YouTube. So we are up to date on our technology. <laughs> Anyone else have any other questions? We're at about uh, 1250, give you 10 minutes back to your day. Thank you all very much for being part of our session today and you all stay well and keep up the good work in helping care for Oklahomans.